we have Nigerian born Adetunji Omotola. He's based in South Africa for now. He's our special guest for today on hashtag The African Dream, your favorite human interest chat show. Welcome to The African Dream. Thank you for having me, Oro. It's great it's to be pleasure. on your platform. It's always a pleasure, Thank sir. Thank you so much. And, um, you're trying to run for office. Um, tell us, what are you running for and where? Okay, so I'll give you a bit of background. Nigeria sure. is a democratic state. Right. We have two major political parties in Nigeria. Right. The ruling party currently is the All Progressive Congress, uh, which the flag bearer is the president, President Muhammadu Buhari. Right. And if you recall, two years ago, he contested against a gentleman by the name of Alaji Abubakar Atiku. Right. Alaji Abubakar Atiku was a former vice president. And he ran on the platform of the People's Democratic Party. Mm. Now, the People's Democratic Party is also the party that produced President Goodluck Jonathan, right. President Obasanjo, and President Umaru Yaradua. So mm -hmm. I am standing for the chairmanship of the People's Democratic Party, the South African chapter. So they are what they call foreign chapters in the People's Democratic Party. So if, you, if you're more than 50 people in any country outside Nigeria right. and you're a member of the PDP, you can form a political party outside Nigeria, which is called the foreign chapter. So I am now running for the top job in the People's Democratic Party foreign chapter, which is South Africa. Tell us a little bit about the, um, um, the strength of um, the Nigerian um, um, PDP party caucus in South Africa. Okay. Look, the PDP party in South Africa was formed in 2001. At that time, I was already a member of the PDP Nigeria, which I joined in 1999 when I returned back from England. Right. I joined the PDP. So the party haven't been formed in 2001. Um, that means it's now 20 years old. So there is a national executive committee where you have the chairman, the deputy chairman, the secretary, the treasurer, the financial secretary, and all of that. And then you have different branches. Each branch will duplicate or mirror the same kind of executive body. So, for example, the WhatsApp group of the PDP South Africa has about 100 people, but the PDP South Africa Facebook page has about 649 friends on Facebook. And on Twitter, there's about 38 people following it. So my sense is that we're at least about 200 members right. of PDB, either active, active members and non-active members, since we jumped into opposition in 2015. So many people have left or they're keeping a low profile because they just feel that opposition is too difficult. <laughs> that that means you probably have a quite an interesting task to um, bring back those that have left as a result of attrition. Um, but I'm sure we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, why PDP? I know you said you've been a member since um, 1999, 2001. First of all, look. If you look at the way that Nigeria is structured, I'm sure you are fully aware that Nigeria has so many different uh, ethnic groups, Igbos, Hausa Fulani, Yorubas, you know, Ijaws, Kalabari, so many tribes. And so when you put that into perspective and you look at the fact that since PDP took the presidency in 1999, we produced a Yoruba president, we produced a northern president in Umaru Yaradua, We've also produced an Ijo president in President Jonathan from the South South. If our PDP is the first political party in Nigeria's history that has produced a president from the minority groups. And also during President Jonathan, PDP government was the first that produced a chief of army staff that comes from the eastern part of Nigeria, the Igbos. So PDP is a very broad church. And it's a party that, you know, is more democratic in the way it carries out its business, gives women more chances with the first finance minister, 
I'm the second female finance minister from PDP. The lady is now the head of the WTO, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Weala. She served under President Jonathan and under President Obasanjo. So PDP is, in my view, a better platform to come up, but also more experience in terms of governance, with our power. We also handed over power to uh, opposition, which has never happened in the history of Nigeria. So there's so many good things that have come out of PDP. So I believe it's a very good platform to contest on. And this is hashtag The African Dream, your favorite human interest chat show. My name is Ronald Fouri, your host and producer. What do you have to convince people to make them vote for you in the South African chapter of the PDP? Well, okay, first of all, my philosophy is moving people from apathy to action. I told you, you know, in diaspora, so many, almost like we're in between a rock and a hard place. So many people cannot get into politics and the local environment, and they feel they're too remote from politics back home. You can't vote from diaspora. I'm sure Ghanaians cannot vote. Zimbabweans cannot vote. Nigerians cannot vote from diaspora. So a lot of people are suffering from apathy. But what I will br bring is, first of all, I'm very educated, very experienced. I'm very, very versatile. I've been in the media, I've been in the wine space, I've been in finance. I'm also quite robust in terms of politics. I'm also somebody who is dynamic. And I've also got the networks, I've got the contacts with key people in our party. I also reach across the aisle, so I'm quite comfortable to talk to people who are not members of PDP. So whilst I'm in PDP, I'm not dogmatic. I don't expect everybody to be in PDP. But also my background as a lawyer, as a communication specialist, will help me to be able to articulate the vision of the party as we look towards elections, general elections in Nigeria in 2023. I've been a former Secretary General of the PDP in South Africa. I've also worked very hard in Nigeria uh, previous years to deliver a candidate who was able to get 10,000 votes in Lagos, which is a very serious APC stronghold. In fact, I remember my stepmother who said to me, we must be crazy to be talking about PDP in Lagos. <laughs> now, we, should, we should get out. You must get out. So for us to go into the den of lions in Lagos and get 10,000 votes in 2011, with very little resources, it means that we can do a lot more now, especially given all the challenges that the ruling party faces and all the challenges of governance, poor governance, and human rights abuses, and even the narrowing of the democratic space. So I'm the man for the season. You mentioned earlier on um, Ngozi, um, who has risen to a very high global pedestal as a woman. Um, and um, the reason I find that interesting is I would want for you to answer later on what you have in place for you um, personally, for your candidature, and if there are any by the PDP to get women more involved and more interested in the party and in political um, activities in general. But before you go to that, let me ask you, you mentioned also about diaspora votes. Um, across Africa, it's very difficult to get folks in the diaspora to vote or to participate in elections in their respective countries. What are some of the problems faced in Nigeria and by Nigerians in the diaspora when it comes to diaspora vote? And what are some of the solutions you would recommend? Okay, look, I think the first thing is that the politicians in Nigeria, because the constitution says that once you're outside the border, that you cannot vote. And also because you need a two third majority of both parliaments. So there are 469 members. So you've got to get about 67 in the Senate, probably about 300 or so in the lower house of representatives, or maybe about 270. So that's quite difficult to do. But I think the critical challenge is that INEC, which is the National Electoral Commission, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC says, we can do it, we're ready, because the biggest problem for INEC would be logistics and all of that. 
So they say, we are ready, right? But it's the same INEC that says to us in diaspora, we give them a budget, they give us an envelope. So if INEC, the electoral body says, we give them a budget, they give us an envelope. So already there's a constraint there, financial constraint, okay? But also what I find is that I think we, what the chairman of the Nigeria Diaspora Commission told us is that, look, in the webinar we had during the early days of lockdown, coronavirus last year, is that each of us must lobby our members of parliament. Nigerians generally have not been known on record to lobby the individual members of parliament around the issue of diaspora voting. Now, there's some progress that has been made. I believe this has moved to the second reading in the lower house. The chairperson of the diaspora committee in the lower house is a lady by the name of Tululokwe uh, Akonde Shadikwe. She's from Oyo State. So she's been quite robust. She's on Twitter. I think the concern they have is really around the integrity, first of all, logistics, and the integrity. Where, how is it going to be done? I mean, we, but you know, we, we, I believe the solution is very simple. If you look at the fact that when they, they come up with things like national identification number, which is NIN, is short form NIN, mm. the ones that the banks use, right. most Nigerians who have bank accounts outside Nigeria, they're able to do the NIN without going to Nigeria. So if you can do the NIN, that means you can get PVCs for Nigerians abroad. But what I feel is that there's no political will, as I've said. But so what we've got to do is lobby our members individually and severally. There was a court case that a gentleman in Canada sponsored, but the case was thrown out of court. I don't remember whether it's lack of jurisdiction or something, mm. but I believe that we have to lobby each member and we have to also say to them that, look, you can't have Nigerians contributing about $23 billion a year in remittances and they're disenfranchised. We're now in the 23rd year of our democracy. By 2023, it will be 24 years of democracy in Nigeria. We can't vote. People are so disgruntled and many people feel like they're not part of the democratic order. So it's got to be about political will, lobby, and there shouldn't be excuses around, uh, oh, we don't have the technology, because we can see that some of the best uh, tech IT companies are coming out from Nigeria. So Flutterwaves and Dellas and so on, they're based that. So why can't we, you know, revolutionize uh, our democratic experiment? So I believe we can make progress. And um, the hope is that, um people who are in power inside the government and people who put those in power, that's the electorate, realize the real power belongs to them as electorate. They realize that um, participating in the democratic process is not only when it's time to go to the ballot and place your thumb or click a button to select a particular candidate, but it moves beyond that where you actually have to be proactive where you actually have to lobby those who we've put into office, where you actually have to write letters to them, go on demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, let them know your grievances, let them know what they're doing, which you don't like. And, you know, we can bring about the change, but we all have to be proactive. We all have to get involved and we all have to let our voices be heard. We don't necessarily have to sit and wait for a tenure of a person in office to be over before we start, in, you know, expressing our grievances. While they're in there, that is the opportunity we have to let them know what we expect of them and let people realize that they have more power than they think they have. Let's go back to the women issue I mentioned, um, Ngozi. Um, tell us how you feel about her personally as a Nigerian and segue into talking about how you intend to get more women not only to be interested in politics, but also to be interested in your manifesto especially in South Africa, and get to get in the, you know, trust of things to be able to work with you if you're elected. Yeah, look, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wella is a rock star because, I mean, she's the first African DG of the uh, W um, 
WTO, the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. I almost said World Health Organization <laughs> because that World gets all the, that gets all the oxygen. <laughs> yeah, it gets all the oxygen right. because of coronavirus. <laughs> so she's a rock star, former MD of uh, the World Bank. You know, she sits on the board of Twitter. She's a chairman of the Gavi for you know vaccines and so on. She's also, uh, you know, she's an MIT graduate, you know, you know, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, for those who don't know the you know, MIT acronym, right. which is the first uh, female finance minister for Nigeria. Then she was first female foreign minister. Then she became the coordinating minister, finance minister, and coordinating minister for the economy for Nigeria. She helped us to pay off our debt. Under President Obasanjo, we paid about eighteen billion dollars. We're owing about thirty-two billion dollars. So she's a rock star. I mean, it was very difficult for us to get the job. I mean, if President Trump had uh, been re-elected, there would have been no success on her part because he was very clear that she wouldn't uh, come up. So we're very proud of her, and I think what is important also is that since her, she's left. All the ministers for finance in Nigeria have been women. So after her was Kemi Adeoshu and now Shamsuddin Usman. So she's left a trail of women successors mm -hmm. after her. So we're very, we're very proud of her. She's very sound. Her CV is very, very comprehensive. She's a practical person. She's very interested in small businesses. She mentions them by name, which is very rare for people at that level. So I think we're making serious progress as a party okay. in terms That's of good. gender balance. That's good. That's very interesting to hear. I mean, I'm a feminist, so I like to see women um, play major roles in very powerful institutions because um, they seem to be able to get their points across and rally people um, behind them, either in support of a person or an ideology. Share a little bit of your manifesto with us so people okay. listening can say, hey, I like this dude. I want to vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> look, I think, look, first of all, you know, I'm a conviction politician. Right. So I believe that politics must go beyond politics and become public uh, policy. And if you, you just asked me a question about voting, so if we take that as a policy in diaspora that we want to vote, then we will be serious about politics. One of the things that I first want to do when I get in is I want to convoke a debate. I believe in debate. My legal training says we must debate. And the debate will be around the issues that concern us as Nigerians and diaspora. Some of those big issues are immigration, economy, and integration. So I would like to see a debate where we look at the political process. Are we really part of it? Are we participating? Even those who are back in Nigeria, what's the percentage of participation of people who have degrees in political science, for example, and they're going into politics? So I would like to create a debate. But also one of the things that I would like to also do is to create an avenue where young people can join the party. Right now, when I look at the people that attend our party meetings, the average age is over 50. And then we have very few women. So if we have 24 people, the average age is 50, and we have two or three women. And that's when we're lucky. So we hardly find any young people coming to our meetings and their members because the language is very, very stale. The language is not invigorating. So we want to bring more young people in. So I'm going to be looking at setting up a PDP Youth League when I become chairman. I'll set up a PDP Youth League so that the young people can be running with their ideas and we can support them. Also, one of the things that I believe is important is I've got to set up a committee, but that will be in January next year, a fundraising committee. There's no political party that will be taken seriously if we don't have resources to be able to go and carry out certain projects. Even when we're not in power, we can still have support for community projects, we can help indigent people, widows, unemployed people. We can be supporting them, whether they're South Africans or Nigerians. We can support NGOs that are looking at motherless babies. 
So we've got to have our own funds that we've got to put in place. Another thing that is missing is that we are not active enough. So I would want to see more regular meetings. The Constitution says that we should have at least one meeting every month. Uh, we don't have regular meetings. And discipline is also missing. So even when people don't attend meetings, there is no sanction. And so once there is no sanction, there is no attendance, the organization falls apart. They're not raising money. So those are some of the things that I've put in my manifesto. But there's also the, the 100 days concept that I've come up with, but not like an American president, but just 100 days to say, what can we do quickly? So I'm going to be setting up a PDP business forum where we can help our members to work together, you know, support one another's businesses. So if we have an attorney or an estate agent in PDP, why are we going outside PDP? to support an estate agent that is not a member of our party. So we're going to be very selfish, right, in ensuring that that happens. But also, over and above that, there's going to be a knowledge exchange seminar mm. that PDP will be having, where we, first of all, we help Nigerians to understand the history of the country, understand the constitution, the parts that give them the fundamental human rights the powers of a president, you know, the powers, you know, election, how does the president get elected? How does the president get removed? All of those things, the sections that guarantee federal character, like section 144, that speaks to a minister, there must be a minister from each state. So that encourages diversity. So everybody feels that they belong in the, in the federal cabinet. So those are some of the things that are in my manifesto. It's quite long, but those right. are the key ones that's, that I That's think. a key summary of it. That's quite interesting. Um, Adetunji, um, tell us a little bit about Nigeria-South Africa relationship um, over the years that you've been in South Africa, what you've seen, what has improved, and what you want to see get better. Okay, first of all, I'll give you a sense of the numbers. So uh, they talk about 120 South African companies doing business in Nigeria. Trade between South Africa and Nigeria is about 66 billion rand, which is plus or minus about $5 billion. Most of the trade from Nigeria is mostly on petroleum products, as you can imagine. But most of the products uh, from South Africa are diversified from telecoms, MTN, to banks with Standard Bank, Stanbic, which is also in Ghana. And then you have your multi choice which is in about 50 African countries. So those companies in Nigeria are doing very, very well. They're big and sizable. Although recently we've had some problems in the retail space with the exit of ShopRite in Nigeria because of the decline in foreign exchange and the very hopeless situation in terms of finding forex. So they've had to leave Nigeria. And then MassMart, which is owned by Walmart, is also trying to make their own escape as well and gain. But those companies have been in Nigeria for well over 15 years. So the successes are more than, if you like, the pain. Of course, the relations between the two countries as regional behemoths, there's been some tension in the past. I mean, we're going for Nigeria and South Africa. We tend to want to go for the same jobs. They sit on the UN Permanent Council. Sorry, the Security Council, a non-permanent seat, leading the AU. If you remember, the last time a South African became the AU chair, Nigeria didn't support Madam Dlamini Zuma because it was around the time that that yellow fever crisis that they deported about 155 Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Nigeria retaliated. And also issues around xenophobia and the MTN fine. So, but on a government-to-government -government level, there isn't a lot of problems. On a person-to-person, -person, there's a lot of problems because there's a perception that Nigerians are, in South Africa at least, they say Nigerians are, some Nigerians are involved in crime. And we do know that some Nigerians are involved in crime, identity theft, issues around, oh, Nigerians are taking South African women. So those are some of the things that create problems. But what my candidacy would do is to begin to address 
If I look at these issues, I talked about debates. We've got to have a debate with South Africans. I'm planning an all Nigeria conference and we'll be getting South Africans involved. So there's a lot of similarities between us. We're both English speaking countries. We're diversified. You know, I mean, South Africa, you have Indians, colors, blacks, and whites. In Nigeria, we have 350 ethnic groups. We've had a difficult history, military rule, very brutal dictatorships. South Africans have had apartheid. You know, we have more that unites us than divides us. Well, Lagos is only five and a half hours from Johannesburg. There are a lot of Nigerians who are married to South Africans. A lot of Nigerians are doing very, very well as well. And, you know, I think because also we're the biggest economy in ECOWAS, South Africa is the biggest. So collaboration is logical. Before we leave you, two things. Tell us, when are the elections? Um, coming on, and how can people connect with you? The elections are on the 13th of November. So it's on a Saturday. And for people to find me, I'm on Facebook, at Tunji Omotola. I'm on Twitter, at Tunji Omotola. I'm on LinkedIn, at Tunji Omotola. I'm on Instagram, Omotola, at My website is at Omotola.com. Folks, this is Oral Ofori, your host and producer of your favorite human interest chat show, hashtag The African Dream. We had for our very special guest today, Adetunji Omotola, a Nigerian diasporian based in South Africa. We talked about his running for office as the chairman of the PDP political party of Nigeria in South Africa. The elections are coming up on the 13th of November, and we wish him all the best. I'll just say, Odabo, say go be kachifo. <laughs> Odabo is goodbye in Yoruba. <laughs> kachifo is uh, in Igbo and say go be in Hausa. But just to say this, um, I believe that um, Nigerians need to also invest more in South Africa. I know that xenophobia has put a, you know, a really bad uh, taste in people's mouths. But we're very excited that Paystack has come in. Epis is also returning back on the 17th of October. They started their inaugural flight last year on the 17th of December. And then also Access Bank has invested $60 million. So we now have Access Bank South Africa. It's a Nigerian bank. They've got a retail banking license. They're going to do their above-the-line uh, media launch on, in, in uh, next month or rather, yeah, I think in November. So all of these things are happening. And by the way, elections in South Africa, local elections are on the 1st of November. So everything is happening around the same know. time. <laughs> and, yeah, and we're, and we're excited that SA started their maiden flight to Accra. Well, not maiden, but the maiden maiden right. on the 28th of September. So Accra is also open. So Ghanaians can also support me come in and uh, let's do this together. This is for Africa. It's not just for me. Because if I win from diaspora in a party, I'm sure the guys in NDC or MPP can also follow the same trajectory because we're all working for a better Africa. Indeed. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Adetunji Omotola. We appreciate your time. We appreciate sharing your knowledge. And we look forward to having you again on this platform. All the best and have a great day. Bye-bye. Good day. Say good day.